Welcome to our video about renal anatomy. This is just a general overview of the structure of the kidney. So let's get started. Before we start, this is just a general overview of the structure of the urinary system. The blood reaches the kidney through the renal arteries, which are branches of the abdominal aorta. The blood then gets filtered by the kidney, and then the urine passes through the ureters on each side, into the urinary bladder, and then to the urethra, and then to the outside. The kidneys are bean-shaped structures with a concave and a convex borders. They are located behind the peritoneum. We call this retroperitoneal. So the kidneys are retroperitoneal structures. They are four or five inches long. This is the size of a large fist. The right kidney is usually below the level of the left kidney because the liver pushes the right kidney slightly downward. The left kidney is located between T12 and L3. And this area is called the costovertebral angle. This is the costovertebral angle, costovertebral. It's located between the rib 12 and the vertebral column. This is where the kidneys are situated. And as we said, the right kidney is slightly lower than the left kidney because of the liver. The upper parts of the kidneys are partially protected by rib 11 and rib 12. These two ribs, the last two ribs are called the floating ribs because they are not connected to the rib cage. The right kidney lies posterior to the liver, while the left kidney lies posterior to the spleen. The blood supply to the kidney is through the renal artery, which is a branch from the abdominal aorta. The venous drainage is through the renal vein into the inferior vena cava. The kidney receives almost one-fourth of the cardiac output, and they filter the blood almost 30 times a day. This is an image that shows the location of the kidney with respect to the peritoneum. This here is the peritoneum. And this is the parietal layer of the peritoneum, and this is the visceral layer of the peritoneum. And if you notice, these are the two kidneys here, and they're situated behind the peritoneum. And as we notice also, the kidneys are surrounded by a thick layer of perirenal fat or perinephric fat, as we're going to discuss in a minute. The kidneys is enclosed by various layers of protective tissues that protects it against trauma and damage. These layers from inside to the outside, the first one is the fibrous capsule which is over here. This is a thick fibrous capsule that encloses the entire kidney. And then we have the perirenal fat or the perinephric fat over here. And then we have the renal fascia, which is over here. And finally, we have the pararenal fat, which is all the way to the outside. As we said, all these layers make sure the kidneys are protected against trauma and damage. The internal structure of the kidney is composed of the renal cortex and the renal medulla. This part here is the renal cortex, which is the outer part of the kidney, and the inner part of the kidney is called the renal medulla. The renal cortex is composed of renal corpuscles and renal tubules. We're going to discuss that later on. The only exception is that part of the renal tubules, which is the lower part of the loop of Henle, are located in the medulla. The medulla is composed of renal pyramids. These are called renal pyramids. The tips of the renal pyramids are called renal papilla. Over here, these are the tips of each renal pyramid. These tips are composed mainly of collecting ducts, and they connect to the minor calluses through which the urine passes from the minor calluses into the major calluses, into the renal pelvis, and finally into the urethra. In between the pyramids, there are cortical projections. These are called cortical columns. These are projections from the cortex into the medulla. So in between two renal pyramids, there is a projection from the cortex into the medulla. This is called cortical columns. So this is a cortical column, this is a cortical column, and this is a cortical column. The renal cortex receives 90% of the total renal blood flow. The medulla only receives 10%. And the lowest area in the kidney which receives blood supply is the renal papilla. So the renal papilla is very liable to ischemia. The renal cortex secretes erythropoietin hormone, which works on the bone marrow and stimulates it to produce red blood cells. Every two or three minor calluses unite together and form a major callus. And this major callus drains into the renal pelvis. And then from the renal pelvis, the urine passes into the ureter, into the urinary bladder. So again, the renal papilla receives the lowest blood supply to the kidney, so it's very liable to ischemia and necrosis. This usually happens in the context of low blood flow to the kidney. The renal pyramids drains into minor calluses and then the minor calluses drains into major calluses 
and then the major calcis drains into the renal pelvis and finally into the ureter. So two or three minor calcis drains into one major calyx and the papilla, as we said, is composed mainly of collecting ducts, which is the final part of the renal tubules. Each pyramid with part of the cortex is called the renal lobe. So each pyramid and the overlying part of the renal cortex all together makes the renal lobe. The renal pelvis is the site of many kidney cancers. Pyronephritis, which is infection of the kidney, and large kidney stones, sometimes called staghorn stones. So can we name these structures? Okay, so what's number one? Number one is the renal lobe. As we said, the renal lobe is composed of a renal pyramid and the part of the cortex above it. So this is a renal lobe. What's number two? Yes, number two is the renal cortex. Number three is the renal medulla. More specifically, this is a pyramid. So we can also say this is a renal pyramid. Number four is the peri-renal fat. What about number five? Number five is the renal capsule. Number six, easy, the ureter. Number seven, what drains into the ureter? So the renal pelvis. Number eight is the artery and vein. Renal artery and renal vein. Number nine is the renal hilum, which is the entrance into the kidney. Number ten is one of the major calyces. So it's a calyx. The blood supply to the kidney is composed of a renal artery. So the abdominal aorta gives off a renal artery to each kidney. So we have the right renal artery and the left renal artery. And then the venous drainage into the renal vein. So we have the right renal vein and we have the left renal vein that drains into the inferior vena cava. As you notice that the left renal vein is slightly longer in course than the right renal vein. The renal artery after entering the kidney divides into what's called segmental arteries. So these are called segmental arteries. And then the segmental arteries divide into what's called interlobar arteries. The interlobar arteries then divides in what's called arcuate arteries. And then finally the arcuate arteries gives off to what's called cortical radiate arteries. So all these branches are called cortical radiate arteries. There is also another name for it, it's called interlobular arteries. So again, the renal artery divides into segmental arteries, and then the segmental arteries divides into interlobar arteries, and then the interlobar arteries divide into arcuate arteries, and finally the arcuate arteries gives off branches called cortical radiate arteries into the cortex. We can also notice from this image that the cortex is heavily supplied in comparison to the medulla. So that's why we always say the cortex receives almost 90% of the blood supply to the kidney. This is another image that shows the blood supply to the kidney. So we start off with the renal artery that gives off the segmental arteries. And then the segmental arteries gives off interlobar arteries. And the reason why it's called interlobar because they run between the renal lobes. Remember the renal lobes? It's the renal pyramid and the overlying part of the renal cortex. These arteries run between the renal lobes, that's why it's called interlobar arteries. And then the interlobar arteries gives off arcuate arteries. And the reason why it's called arcuate because they are straight. The arcuate arteries then gives off the cortical radiate arteries, or what's called interlobular arteries. These interlobular arteries eventually gives off the afferent arteriole that enters into the renal corpuscle and gives off a tuft of capillaries called the renal glomeruli. The glomerular capillaries will reunite and form the efferent arteriole. And then the efferent arteriole will branch off again 
and form another group of capillaries called peritubular capillaries. These capillaries run around the renal tubules and they contribute to the reabsorption and secretion. That's the function of the kidney. Finally, the peritubular capillaries will reunite again and form the interlobular veins, which is homologous to the interlobular arteries. And then the interlobular veins drains into the arcuate veins, and then the arcuate veins drains into the interlobar veins, and finally, these interlobar veins drains into the renal vein. Remember that there is no segmental veins in comparison to the segmental arteries. So in the arterial system, there is segmental artery, but in the venous system, there is no segmental veins. <laughs> Now let's talk about the nephron. The nephron is the structural and functional unit of the kidney. Each kidney has about 1 million nephrons. The nephron consists of the renal corpuscle and the renal tubule. This part of the image here represents the renal corpuscle. The rest of the image represents the renal tubule. So the renal corpuscle consists of the glomerulus, which is a network or tuft of capillaries, and the Bowman's capsule. The Bowman's capsule is the capsule surrounding the glomerulus. The renal tubule consists of the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, and finally the collecting duct. So the part of the tubule that's most proximal to the renal corpuscle is called the proximal convoluted tubule. And then this tubule continues as the loop of Henle. The loop of Henle has three parts. Thin descending limb, thin ascending limb, and thick ascending limb. And then after that, the distal convoluted tubule, because it's distal to the glomerulus. And finally, the distal convoluted tubule continues as the collecting duct. Finally, this collecting duct, as we said, will open into one of the renal papilla and then opens into the calcium system. The nephron functions infiltration, reabsorption, secretion, and excretion, which finally leads to the production of urine. There are two types of nephrons based on the location of the renal corpuscles. When the renal corpuscles are present on the outer two-thirds of the cortex, this is called cortical nephrons, and this represents 85% of the nephrons. When the renal corpuscle of the nephron is present in the inner third of the cortex, we call this juxtamedullary nephron. Juxta means near to or close to, because these nephrons are close to the medulla more than the cortical nephrons. The loop of Henle of the juxtamedullary nephrons loops more or dig more deep into the medulla compared to the cortical nephrons. The image over here represents a type of the juxta medullary nephrons since the loop of Henle digs more deep into the medulla. This is another image that shows the difference between cortical nephrons versus juxta medullary nephrons. Juxta means close to or near to, and so these nephrons are close to the medulla. The cortical nephrons has the renal corpuscles located in the outer two-thirds of the cortex, the juxta medullary nephrons has the renal corpuscles located in the inner third of the cortex close to, medu to the medulla. And since they're more close to the medulla, their loop of Henle's digs more deep into the medulla compared to the cortical nephrons. The cortical nephrons represents the majority of nephrons of the kidneys. They represent 85% of all the nephrons. The juxta medullary nephrons only represent 15% of the nephrons. All these nephrons or the tubules of these nephrons drains into the collecting ducts and then the collecting ducts drains into the renal papilla, and then from the renal papilla, the urine goes into the minor and major calluses, the renal pelvis, and finally into the urethra. Now let's talk about the renal corpuscle, which is the blood filtering component of the nephron. It consists of the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule. The glomerulus is a tuft of capillaries lined by fenestrated endothelial cells. This is an image of a capillary, and you can see the endothelial cells, and in between them there are pores or openings or fenestrations. These are the fenestrations that makes the passage of the substances or the filtrate of the blood. Intraglomerular mesangial cells are modified smooth muscle cells that lie between the capillaries. The Bowman's capsule has an outer parietal layer of squamous epithelium, an inner layer of podocytes. These podocytes have food processes called pedicles, and these pedicles wrap around the glomerular capillaries to form what's called the filtration slits. So the pedicles of adjacent podocytes interdigitate with each other and form the filtration slits. If this is podocytes, 
with the food processes. And this is another podocyte with their food processes. These food processes interdigitate and form what's called the filtration slits. Through these filtration slits, the filtrate or the glomerular filtrate pass into the Bowman's capsule. This is an image of a renal corpuscle. The blood reaches the renal corpuscle through the afferent arterio and then passes into the glomerular capillaries. Then the filtrate of the blood passes through the fenestrations between endothelial cells and then through the filtration slits made by the pedicles of the podocytes into the Bowman's space. Then the filtrate continues its passage into the proximal convoluted tubule and the rest of the renal tubules. The Bowman's capsule is composed of two layers, an outer parietal layer composed of squamous cells, and inner layer of podocytes. These podocytes, as we said, has food processes called pedicles that wraps around the glomerular capillaries, and they interdigitate with the pedicles of adjacent podocytes to form the filtration slits. These filtration slits control which substances can pass through these filtration slits and which substances cannot pass. So, for example, large proteins cannot pass through these filtration slits. Intraglomerular mesangial cells are modified smooth muscle cells that are present between the glomerular capillaries. Since they are smooth muscles, they have some contractile properties and they control the flow of blood through these glomerular capillaries. They also have some phagocytic activity, so they engulf proteins and substances that get trapped into the glomerular basement membranes. It also secretes the extracellular matrix. The blood then continues its passage after leaving the glomerular capillaries into the efferent arterioles. Now let's talk about a structure called juxtaglomerular apparatus. This is a structure in the kidney that's located between the afferent arterial and the distal convoluted tubule. This is the afferent arterial and this is the distal convoluted tubule. The group of cells or the area over here is called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. There are three types of cells in the juxtaglomerular apparatus. The first is called macula densa cells, and these are located in the wall of the distal convoluted tubules. The green cells here represent the macula densa cells. These cells are very sensitive to the level of sodium in the renal filtrate. So when the level of sodium falls in the renal filtrate, they get stimulated, and they stimulate the nearby juxtaglomerular cells to release renin. The renin will then work on the renin angiotensin aldosterone system to increase the sodium reabsorption. The second function is it stimulates the vasodilatation of the afferent arterioles, so that way it increases the blood delivery into the renal glomeruli. The second type of cells is called the juxtaglomerular cells. Juxta means near to or close to. These cells are also called granular cells, and as I said, these are the cells that secretes the renin, and they are located in the wall of the afferent arteriole. So over here, these are representing the juxtaglomerular cells. The third type of cells are called extraglomerular mesangial cells. Remember, we had the intraglomerular mesangial cells, which were modified smooth muscle cells that have some contractile property. These cells also have some contractile property, but their function not really well understood. So in general, the juxtaglomerular apparatus has a role in regulating the blood pressure and also in the filtration rate or controlling the filtration rate of the glomerulus. We've reached the end of our video. Thanks for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe. See you next video. Thank <laughs> you.